Good Sunday morning, everyone, and welcome to Norma DeFi United Church of Christ. Wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And as many of you know, um, Pastor Amy uh, is on study leave this week, so Kirsten Pangolinen will be sharing some of the things she learned at the Jubilee Justice Leadership Conference um, she took this past spring. So now we're going to pause for a moment to reflect and acknowledge that we are on the unceded land of the Duwamish people, a people who are still here and who continue to honor and bring to light their ancestral heritage. All right, so um, we'll start with our words of gathering. I will read the light, and if you will join me in reading the dark print. Holy One, open our eyes, so that we may see the oppressed and the distraught among us. Open our eyes, so that we can see them, we can take to make a difference. Open our ears. So we hear the cries of the poor and the hungry. Open our hands. So we hear your and know what to do. Open our hands. So we work in our own corner of the world to improve it. Open our hearts to all our siblings in need. Open our hearts to you as we trust you to show us your way. Amen. Please stand as you're able to uh, join us in the first song of For a World. <laughs>
our tech helpers. I know they're working really hard at getting our projector to work, but we can do this even without a projector. It's all good. If you'll join me now in prayer. Source of life, who is known by many names, overturner and illuminator of hearts, we gather with gratitude for the earth and all who journey in it. We give thanks for the interconnectedness of all creation. Source of justice, who's known by many names, let us not swerve from the path of righteousness that leads to just and equitable relationships. Give us the will to leave behind the safety of our sanctuaries to become your living sanctuary and claim our place in the movement to transform creation that our voice, our heart, our spirit will join the voice, heart, and spirit of all who demand to live with respect, justice, and peace. Amen. Oh, look at that. You guys are awesome. Yay, tech people. Yay. Oh, you're a dream. Thanks, everybody, for doing that. And it's just in time for the picture that we um, Well, you guys can see that. Our intergenerational moment today, well, I'm giving it away. It's about a man named Baird Rustin. But I wanted to uh, first open up and say that when I was trying to determine like what parts of the Jubilee program I should share, I decided I just really needed to narrow it down to the lessons that had the biggest impact on me because we had six months of lessons. So there was a lot to choose from. But one powerful concept that we learned about is called social change ecosystem. And um, I think it's in your bulletin as well as Vicki will have it up there in just a second, but how many parts can effectively work together as one to bring about change. And on this slide, um, and in your bulletins, for those of you who are here, um, you'll see an example of one of these ecosystems. And you can think about all of these different skill sets or characteristics or aptitudes um, that different people have, obviously. And I hope you just take a minute and kind of read through these. I think they are pretty self-explanatory, but like a weaver is a person who weaves a lot of different information or people together. A guide can guide people through a process or through an experience. Storytellers obviously are people who, I'm looking at you, Melinda, you're our, you were our historian for a long time, you're a storyteller. Um, healers, disruptors, caregivers, builders, visionaries, frontline responders, and experimenters. And just take a minute and kind of think about like, what do you think are the two or three maybe that describe you the best? And, you know, maybe you're looking at your spouse or your good friend and you're thinking that person has a lot of different kinds of skills than I do. And we actually spend a lot of time in our class um, really thinking about this a lot and digging down deep into our strengths and actually to very specific gifts that we have. And we also worked on identifying weaknesses or gaps in different groups that we belong to, like where you see the places that you maybe need to build people up or bring more people in who have the skills that you need. So, for example, it's great if you have a bunch of caretakers, but if you don't have any visionaries, it all kind of goes to pot, right? And vice versa, if you have too many visionaries and not enough caregivers or doers, that doesn't work either. So the lesson is that successful groups uh, working towards really big changes need to attract and develop all of these kinds of people and skill sets. So now I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit, um, but keep thinking about that, you can think about that. And I want to, I want the folks here to raise your hand if you know some of these names or, or events. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Anybody heard, ever heard of that guy? Yeah. How, well, how about the March on Washington in 1963? Ever heard of that? The I Have a Dream speech? How about Rosa Parks? Know the name? Yeah, Montgomery uh, bus boycott. How about Mahatma Gandhi? Anybody ever heard of that guy? <laughs> and how about the nonviolence movement? Have you ever heard of that? Sure. Now, how about Bayard Rustin? Let's hear it for Bayard Rustin. <laughs> how many people know him? I know Lynn does because it's one of our Sunday school lessons. But but not a lot of people have heard his name, right? You just saw his picture up there a minute ago. Um, but guess what? He was one of the critical people of the... Uh, of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, but he actually had done a lot of the things we think about in the 1960s had happened to him in the 1940s. Like he um, refused to move to the back of the bus in the 1940s and he went to jail. Uh, he went to India in the late 40s and learned about the nonviolence movement from followers of Gandhi. And he actually took that back to Dr. King 
in the 1960s and encouraged him to be a nonviolent advocate. At the time, Dr. King had armed security guards and Barry Gress is the one who said, if you're gonna be a nonviolent advocate, you have to get rid of all your guns and all your weapons. And uh, so that was, that was pretty impressive. He did all that. But the other thing that he did with the March on Washington is he was the porta potty guy. You know, he was the behind the scenes, he made sure there were toilets. He trained off duty police officers to direct traffic. He got a little cleanup crew to make sure there was no trash left behind. So even though we haven't heard his name a lot, maybe we should, because he was one of those behind the scenes person who made all of that other stuff possible that we know about. So I hope you'll really take some time to learn about this guy. He's very, very interesting. But the takeaway is that he's proof that to change the world, all people, all skills, all good ideas need to be nurtured and incorporated. And we can't all be a Dr. King, but we can all use our own unique gifts to help make the world a better place. Thank you. Now Mark's gonna lead us in our prayer. Please join me in the prayer, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, it's the UCC prayer for social justice. Again, I'll read the light and you read the dark. Pray for those who are hungry. Pray hard for those who will not feed them. Pray for those who struggle each week to pay their bills. Pray harder for the wealthy who do not care. Pray for those who are homeless. Pray hard for those who deny them shelter. Pray for the sick and lonely. Pray hard for those who do not give them comfort. Pray for those who cry out for dignity. Pray harder for those who will not listen. Pray for those oppressed by unjust wages. Pray harder for those who exploit them. Pray for those who hear the yoke, or sorry, bear the yoke of prejudice. Pray harder for those who discriminate against them. Pray for those whose basic needs are denied. Pray harder for public officials who cater to the greed and ignore those bound unjustly. Amen. Our words of assurance are, our God hears all prayers. Thanks be to God. And please stand as you're able to join us in the next song, The Universe is Bending. share from our sacred story. The first will be Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 20, New Revised Standard Version. 
For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. Him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. Our gospel reading um, is Luke eleven thirty seven through 46 and verses 52 and 54. And before I read um, this passage of scripture, please uh, try to hear this through a social justice lens. Jesus speaking to people who represent established power, not as Jesus versus the Jews. When he finished that talk, a Pharisee asked him to dinner. He entered his house and sat right down at the table. The Pharisee was shocked and somewhat offended when he saw that Jesus didn't wash up before the meal. But the master said to him, I know you Pharisees, buff the surface of your cups in place so they sparkle in the sun, but I know your insides are maggot, maggoty with greed and secret evil. Stupid Pharisees, didn't the one who made the outside also make the inside? Turn both your pockets and your hearts inside out and give generously to the poor. Then your lives will be clean, not just your dishes and your hands. I've had it with you. You're hopeless, you Pharisees, frauds. You keep meticulous account books, hiding on every nickel and dime you get, but manage to find loopholes for getting around basic matters of justice and God's love. Careful bookkeeping is commendable, but the basics are required. You're hopeless, you Pharisees, frauds. You love sitting at the head of the table at church dinners. You love printing yourselves in the radiance of public flattery, frauds. You're just like unmarked graves. People will walk over that nice grassy surface, never suspecting the rot and corruption that is six feet under. One of the religion scholars spoke up. Teacher, do you realize that in saying these things, you're insulting us? He said, yes. And I can even, I can be even more explicit. You're hopeless. You religion scholars, you load people down with rules, with regulations, nearly breaking their backs, but never lift even a finger to help. You're hopeless, you religion scholars, you took the key of knowledge, but instead of unlocking doors, you locked them. You won't go in yourself and won't let anyone else in either. As soon as Jesus left the table, the religion scholars and Pharisees went into a rage. They went over and over everything he said, plotting how they could trap him in something from his own mouth. And I failed to notice, uh, to mention that this is from the message uh, translation. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mark. You guys know Clueless, that's one of my favorite movies. It's way harsh. It's a little harsh. Um, oh, Vicki, do you mind just leaving that up for just two seconds? The, um... Thank you, I'm sorry about that. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kirsten Pangolinen, and many of you know me as a longtime church member, and I'm also currently the office manager at our church. Um, but wait, what you may not know is that this past January through June, I took a um, UCC education program called the Jubilee Justice Leadership Program. And it was started several years ago by Reverend Rich Gamble of Keystone UCC in North Seattle and other people as well. Well, I just wanted you guys to see, I, I'm gonna, do you, do you know who uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is? Can you see the quote? I just wanted you to see the quote, that's what I can say. Um, uh, so anyway, originally it was a program that was designed for people just coming out of college who were interested in social justice work, and they lived in community um, in the Seattle area, and they had internships, and they um, 
you know, learned and studied together and shared with one another. But during the pandemic, the program was re-envisioned as an online program that was open to all ages and from all around the country. So actually in our cohort, we had a woman from Texas and this coming fall, they have a person participating from Ethiopia, which is super cool. So it's becoming a broader kind of program, but that's just a little bit of a, a background on that. But anyway, I didn't know if, if people are familiar with Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a German Lutheran pastor and a founding member of the Confessing Church and was persecuted. He was an anti-Nazi and was persecuted by them and eventually uh, murdered right before the end of World War II. So anyway, he's kind of an inspirational guy. I like him. So I wanted you to see that little quote. Thank you, Vicki, for putting that. Um, I also, um, there's another slide that Vicki was gonna show too that just, just as an opening, uh, because there's no way that I can tell you every single thing that we did in six months, obviously in 10 minutes. So, but I wanted you to see some of the different topics that we covered just so you would have kind of an idea of the overall uh, thing. But, um, and, if, and if any of you are interested in the program and want me to connect you with the, um, with the coordinator, I'd be happy to do that. But that gives you some idea of some of the, the big topics that we covered. We also all had, we had sojourning time, which was with a separate person that we would reflect and do a lot of kind of personal work. And then we also all had an internship where we had a volunteer job. So I worked for One America, which is an, uh, an anti-hate group that works with immigrants and recent and re refugees, people like that. So it's super fun and I'm still working with them and I love them. Anyway, um, but I can talk about, about that all the time. In, just in speaking of that, I also put together just kind of a little social justice resource page in the back there. So if you just, if some of the things that I mentioned, if you're curious about it, please pick one of those up and take some time looking at it. All right, so why was I interested in this program? Well, like many of you, uh, I reached a point in the past couple of years where I felt pretty powerless, you know, the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, climate change, all of these huge problems that felt so overwhelming and depressing. And I would march and I, you know, read a book and put a sticker on my car and donate to a cause. But it felt like, you know, I had a watering can out there trying to put out a forest fire. <laughs> like, how, you know, how do any one little person make a huge change? And so I was curious about what does, a, what does it mean to do social justice, like bigger than, than other things? And who are the people who are doing it? And what are the organizations who are doing it? And what's the vocabulary around it and the strategies? So. Uh, to start by just explaining what social justice is, I'll share a story that Rich, um, Rich Gamble shared with us in one of our very first sessions. And it's meant to illustrate the difference between social justice work and direct service, which I think a lot of people sometimes confuse the two. So once upon a time, there's a factory and it's built up the river from a town. And over time, pollutants from this factory get dumped into the river, they go downstream, People are using the river, they start getting sick, they die, um, sick people can't work, so they're suddenly in need of food banks and kids lose their parents and need an orphanage. So the townspeople set all of these services up and they set up hospitals and orphanages and food banks. And, and it's wonderful, right? I mean, all of these actions or maybe more appropriately reactions to the situation, those are called direct service. You're directly helping somebody. And direct service isn't easy. And I look around, so many of us, so many of you are very involved in direct service with Hospitality House and the Food Bank and Mary's Place. And it's all wonderful. And I'm not at all trying to disparage um, direct service at all. But the advantages of direct service is that, number one, it has a direct um, effect, right? Like if you cook a meal and then you feed it to a hungry person and they're satisfied and yay, like you just fed a hungry person, that's awesome. And it makes them feel good and it makes you feel good. And that's terrific. It has a tan tangible, meaningful kind of a result. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my place just a moment. So turn the page, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. But the program that I did wasn't called Jubilee Direct Service Leadership Program, right? It's called Social Justice Program. And that's a somewhat harder concept um, it's less tangible, it's more uncomfortable because people doing social justice work are sometimes scorned or injured or even killed like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right? Um, and guess what? A lot of people don't like the status quo upended. Um, a person working for social justice also 
may not live to see the results of their hard work because social justice can sometimes take tens and even hundreds of years to achieve. And social justice is also a fight that often needs to be refought generation after generation. So what do you think? What does, what does social justice look like in this factory up, up the river story? Like what are some examples of, instead of like building an orphanage, what, were, what are some like social justice solutions to the factory? What do you guys think? Yell it out, it's okay. Perfect, Wendon just said regulations about what they can put in the water. That's a perfect example. Fighting for, for let's make sure we have regulations so we don't have junk in our water that we have to drink, right? Other ideas? Cleaning up what they've already done, great. And then preventing it from happening in the future, right? Exactly, those are, those are great examples. Anybody else? I know sometimes people need another thing. But those are great examples. And that's exactly right. Um, social justice is organizing people to vote for people who will put those kinds of regulations into place or who value that, right? Um, they'll pass laws that protect people's health. They'll make it illegal for factories to dump. Um, it's for maybe supporting industries that don't have that after effect of having to put pollutants into the river, right? Maybe you support another factory that doesn't do that kind of thing. Um, but it's taking a public stand and talking at a town council meeting, joining with others, right? It's learning how to be a helpful and respectful ally to people who are maybe already doing some of that work. Maybe you figure out how to join a group that's already doing it. Um, but it also means that, you know, you're gonna probably make some people angry because some people don't want that change. Even people who are maybe being poisoned by that, they're worried, Am I, I'm gonna lose my job. You know, they're gonna, that factory, if we make too much of a fuss, they're gonna take these jobs somewhere else. Um, and you're upsetting people who maybe have power and influence, right? So, um, and there, there can be retaliation, right? But really, social justice is the only way to make real lasting change. Um, so direct service is more like a band-aid on systemic inequities. And social justice is harder, but it's more transformative and powerful. So anyway, because the Jubilee Justice Leadership Program was developed by people in the UCC, our first classes were rooted in biblical lessons. Um, and the main start of starting with the Bible, the main point of starting with the Bible was that it gave us a moral foundation to stand on. And Rich wasn't as interested in like pulling out specific quotations or something and saying, um, you know, Moses and Jesus were social justice warriors. That wasn't his point, but it was more to look at kind of the big arc of the story of the Bible. Um, you know, when we look at thousands of years of history and stories and poems and different voices and perspectives and agendas that are all in the Bible, but there's a big pattern there, right? Like over and over, God and your prophets are challenging the powerful and challenging that passive acceptance of, well, I guess this is just the way things are. So we just have to accept it. Um, and challenging people who want to choose comfort over the truth. So many of the stories in the Bible are about exposing and toppling those oppressive power structures and reminding people that God's ways are not the world's ways, right? So of course, I'm not a biblical scholar, but the reason I wanted to share those two passages that Mark read is that I think they help um, show a couple of ways that social justice is portrayed in the Bible. Like on the one hand, in the Deuteronomy passage, we have an image of God as a powerful, awe-inspiring, like almost like a superhero who's always doing the right thing, you know, is not partial, takes no bribes, executes justice. And obviously we're encouraged to do the same thing, right? To love the stranger, to um, love our neighbors as ourselves. But sometimes that's such a broad um, directive that we can kind of excuse ourselves when we don't do it 100%, right? Because like, I'm not a superhero and I'm not God and I can't do that big, big, big thing. Um, so that's why I like that juxtaposition of the other story where Jesus basically just comes into this room and calls these people out. <laughs> you know, he, he says it very directly and he says, and it's uncomfortable. And he uses a situation that we can all relate to. He comes into a house, he didn't follow the rules, he didn't wash his hands. Um, and they're trying to shame him. And he's like, no way, right? 
you're just, uh, he accuses them, you're hiding behind all of these trivial rules and expectations because you're trying to avoid the things that God is really asking you to do. And, you know, we see this all the time, right? People are focused on appearing like they're doing the right thing, um, but, but actually they aren't really doing the right thing. They're so busy making sure that everyone's washing their hands and has sparkling dishes that they aren't addressing the rot underneath them. So, and as a brief aside, I'll just, some of you are aware of this, but you may know that the UCC is working on address, addressing the history of racism and misogyny within our denomination, trying to dig it out, hold it up to the light, put some examination and transparency on, on that. And um, you know what? Different people are having different reactions. Some people are hurt and angry and embarrassed and defensive. Others are glad it's happening, but they don't think it's happening the right way or fast enough. And, but, you know, honestly, my feeling is that no matter how imperfect that process is, I'm, I'm really thankful that the UCC is attempting to do that hard work instead of that maggoty rot, which I love that quote. Uh, the UCC is trying to expose it. And I think that's the first step in a long, long road to justice. And that's real world stuff that I think Jesus was referring to, not like superhero kind of stuff. That's really like in the nitty gritty, dirty, hurty, hurtful sometimes, but, in, but possible and doable. And it just takes the desire and the will to do it. So this leads me to another takeaway from the Jubilee Justice Leadership Program. And that is the concept of courage. And this wasn't specifically a topic that we addressed, that was addressed specifically. But it came up over and over again because within my cohort, people, um, you know, they're trying to figure out, they want to figure out how to be better champions for social justice. But many of us ex express our fear, right? And lack of courage. It's, it's hard to know how to, and how do you overcome that fear? So for example, like a lot of questions came up like, well, how do you find the courage to stand up for social justice? What if I do it the wrong way? Or what if I try something and it doesn't work? Or what happens if I make people angry because I'm doing this and my friends don't want to talk to me anymore? Or how can I be a good ally and not offend people who you know, are already doing some of this work? Um, would I be willing to be thrown in jail? What, what if I get hurt physically or mentally or emotionally? And like, really, what am I willing to risk? And some of these same concerns um, may have held you back. I mean, I know it's true for me too. I know when I've gone on marches, my husband's like, oh my God, what if there's a shooter? And, you know, and it's a, it's a scary thing, right? But, um, but here's some of the ideas that we, that we kind of came up with throughout our class. Well, first of all, just being in the class or being in any kind of a community where people are interested in social justice and want to do that kind of work um, is a great place to start because courage builds on courage, right? So um, any step you're making in that direction is a great start. You should pat yourself on the back. And being in community not only, um, you know, builds networks of power, but it's also sustaining as a place of refuge and recharging and regaining our courage when, when it's needed. And as I mentioned before, having a moral framework as a touchstone helps a lot. Um, as a UCC-centered group, our foundation was the Bible, obviously, and our belief that God wants to see justice in our world and knowing and believing in that gives can give you a lot of courage. The other thing that sounds maybe sounds a little strange, but we did some work with creativity and music and the arts. Like we looked at clever street art and street sign protest signs, right? And songs and music. And one of the guys in our group um, is an actor. And he's part of the theater of the oppressed, which some of you may have heard of, but that's using a lot of like acting um, techniques and sort of, and working for social change, which was really interesting. Uh, uh, one of the groups that I mentioned on the paper is a group called the Resistance Revival Choir. And one of their taglines is they sing to encourage others in social justice work. And some of their songs are really great on YouTube. So that was another group that we were introduced to. Um, so anyway, I guess my point is it's not all doom and gloom, like when when uh, you have when you're singing together or laughing together or you know looking at art together, it's it's relaxing and it's fun and it's um, and it makes you realize that there's lots of people out there using their creativity in lots of different ways, and it's good to know that you're surrounded by groups of people like that, knowing we're not alone, gives us a lot of courage. So, and as for me, um, learning more about the history of social justice movements and the successful strategies that they employed gave me courage as well. You know that it's worked. 
it works. And a topic that we explored quite a bit was the nonviolence movement and how successful it is. And when we first started talking about this, I, along with probably many of you, was a little bit doubtful about that. I was like, really? Because, you know, you see Martin Luther King Jr. was killed and Gandhi was killed and Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed. But in the, but in the big scope of things, nonviolence is actually um, more successful than violent um, attempts to, for social change. And I just want to introduce this, this name to you, um, a person named Erica Chenoweth. And again, I uh, put their name on, the, on that sheet. But to briefly summarize, Erica Chenoweth was a military history buff, like from the time uh, they were a little girl or a little child, and loved stories about battles and generals, and grew up to be a political scientist, specifically um, focused on terrorism and how to overcome terrorism or fight back against terrorism. And so at some point, um, Erica was invited to this conference about nonviolence and was very disdainful about it, like, really? I'll just go just to basically you know, tweak you guys because that's so stupid. And so basically just argued with everything that was being presented at this conference. And finally, someone um, confronted Erica and said, wow, well, if you're so convinced that nonviolence doesn't work, why don't you, uh, why don't you prove it, right? So Erica and this other woman named Maria did years of research. They studied all of these nonviolent movements versus violent movements and was completely stunned that it's far and away the more successful way to bring about lasting change. And I mean, you could read her book, obviously, but she also has like little 20 minute videos on YouTube that you could watch just to kind of get a glimpse of some of her research. And it's so interesting and really kind of mind blowing. Um, but it's also, that's very encouraging, right? To know that, so, uh, excuse me, that nonviolence really works. And there's lots of strategies around nonviolence that we talked about as well. So, um, okay. See, I got ahead of myself again. That's why I love talking to you guys because you're so patient with me. <laughs> uh, so anyway, all right. So to illustrate some of these ideas of moral foundation and courage and nonviolence that I've just shared with you, I want to tell you the story of Gandhi's Salt March, and I promise I'm, I'm wrapping it up here. Um, so do you guys know about Gandhi's Salt March? Has anyone ever heard about it? Um, well. And, you know, I think when we first started talking about it, I think I kind of had a vague recollection, but I didn't know any of the details or even why, why there was a salt march. But so to go back a little bit, um, as most of you know, all of you know, probably India was a colony of the British, of Great Britain for many, many, many years. And Gandhi and the Indian National Congress were trying to engage with the British to gain their independence and also just to be treated as equal human beings and not as you know, not as basically slaves to the British. And, but basically they were rebuffed constantly. The British didn't want to meet with them, didn't want to talk to them. Um, so in 1930, Gandhi came up with this plan. And a lot of people thought it was ridiculous and silly and people mocked him and thought it was just, it was going to be a disaster. But spoiler alert, it didn't. It wasn't a disaster, it worked. So to get the attention of them and to get them to the negotiating table, he knew he had to get millions of Indians with just as many agendas and personalities and goals and all of that to join together in civil disobedience. So basically, he needed the Indian people to stop participating in the system that was oppressing them and to upend the power structure as it was. And he focused on salt. And so why salt? Well, because one way that the British Raj kept the people downtrodden is they salt, it was mandated that you had to buy salt from the British government. You could not go collect your own salt or buy it from another source. You had to get it from the British. And um, of course, salt is a basic human necessity like air or water or anything else. And so Gandhi knew that um, even though the poor carried the biggest burden of having to pay, pay for salt, because of course, out of, you know, it's the same price for everybody. So the poor are going to have to out of their budget, it's more for them. Um, but he knew that everyone was still affected by it, right? So uh, there's a book called This is an Uprising by Mark Engler and Paul Engler. And they, they said, this was textbook moral injury, right? Everybody is being injured by this, this tax, by this cost. And that's very foundational. And of course, 
found he wasn't Christian, but his belief that all people should be allowed self-determination and treated equally is rooted in that ubiquitous morality, right? So back to the story, um, Gandhi started with just 70 or so followers and they began walking towards the sea. It was like a 200 mile journey, right? And as he walked, more and more people joined his group and even when they would stop for the night, like thousands of people would gather. Like the first night, it was like 3,000. And by the, near the end of it, it was like 50,000 people were joining him near the end. Um, and pretty soon, like walkers were behind him miles and miles. <clears throat> and so, and in this growing community, they found courage, right? They found strength. Uh, they sang songs along the way. They prayed together. Um, and they gained more media attention too, right? Because... Um, I think the British, of course, had hoped that this was just going to be this big flop and it's just a silly thing that happened. But it's but different news agencies from around the world started picking up the story and the publicity kind of protected them, right? Because all these people from around the world were following their story. They were captivated by the drama. They're wondering what's going to happen at the end. And so about 20 some days later, Gandhi and his followers stepped out onto the beach, right? And he reached down. You can just picture it all, right? He took a little handful of sandy, salty sand and he boiled it in water and he illegally made a little salt for himself. And then everyone around him did the same thing, right? All these thousands of people made some salt for themselves. And it was, it just was explosive, right? And that simple, that nonviolent act, right? He didn't, that's, that's what he did. He made some salt, um, but it, it put into motion for months a whole bunch of other nonviolent uh, protests. So people quit their jobs. They started boycotting British cotton. Um, they stopped paying taxes they thought were unfair that had been, you know, deliberately to suppress, hold people down. And basically, the Indian people just refused to participate in their own subjugation. And the British responded with violence and arrests. They arrested over sixty thousand people. Gandhi went to jail. But basically, that the wheels of social justice had been set in motion. And it was going to be years until India actually celebrated its independence in the 1940s. But that salt march was the critical beginning of people realizing that they could do that. So in closing, I'm sure you've heard that saying that, you know, a swimming fish doesn't realize it's in the ocean, right? It's just swimming. And I think we're like that too, right? We're all just born into this world. We're living in it. We're experiencing it the way we're experiencing it. And we just imagine this is just, well, this is how it is. This is what I was born to. And it's not easy to step outside of ourselves, right? It's not easy to look at our situation objectively. Um, it's not always easy to hear other people say, that's not how I'm experiencing it. I, I have this other experience, right? Because we have our own little bubble that we're living in. But I think that's what God's asking us to do when we're told to welcome the stranger and to love our neighbors as ourselves. When we're told to stop worrying about the external appearances and to really start working on cleaning up the insides of ourselves. Um, I think God wants us to listen and respond when we learn about injustice and inequity. God wants us to imagine a different world than the one that we're living in, one that's bigger, kinder, more inclusive, more fair to everyone. May it be so, and may it be so. Amen. Thank you. Oh. I'm the introducer. Okay, our next song is Spirit of Jesus, If I Love My Neighbor. Please stand if you're able. <laughs>
you. You may be seated. And now I know we're going to pause for just a minute. I'll give Vicki and Nancy a chance to pause because we'll do our joys and concerns. And first of all, can I just say thank you and round of applause for you in prayer, lifting up to you the joys and concerns, the hopes and dreams of our lives. May we be open to your voice in our lives that we may see with new eyes and hear with new ears the direction you will have us go. Hear our prayers for those who are in pain, those who are ill, and those who are grieved. Thank you also for the many joys we experience and share today. May we touch the lives of our loved ones and community members, not only through our prayers, but through our lives and actions as well. Guide us, bless us, uplift us, and hold us, for we are your children called to your purpose in your world. Hear our prayers, those spoken, and those hidden in our hearts, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. And now please join me as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. treasure and as we can see up here we're still in August for a few more days uh, so if you still have donations for hospitality house I know Alice is more than happy to take them and another actually so that there's a list in the tow line but there's also one out on the kiosk if you're if you're still um, so and I know uh, just another reminder that the annual meeting is on September 11th, but it's Zoom only, and that's so that everybody's on the same. I think they're trying to figure out if there's a way that maybe if people want to come in person, they can sit like in the library, and then I'll raise their hand. But basically, we all need to be able to see everybody in the same spot to be able to vote on things. So, um, But we do, do need a quorum, and I put some proxy forms out there. So if you know for sure that you're not going to be able to be here well, on Zoom, um, on the 11th, if you could find somebody you know will be here, then and make them your proxy to vote. And they can vote on either everything that you're interested in voting on or just select things so you can designate all of that. Um, and before we have other people share too, this is also a time uh, if you want to make a donation to the church, there's a offering plate in the back or there's certainly many, many ways on our website that you can give or you can mail in a check. And obviously we so appreciate all of your gifts um, in all the ways that so many of you give, you fill so many ways. So thank you. But how about other things, Lynn? You, I I knew you're gonna. Okay. You want to just come up here? You want me to move? Okay. Oh. All right, me again. Um, last week I reminded you about some events. And Amy kind of got it went wrong week, but this is the week. This Tuesday, we will be having uh, our next session of the uh, uh, White Peacemaker, no, Dear White Peacemakers, not Peacekeepers, I got it wrong last time. And we'll be meeting Tuesday, um, either in the fellowship or the fireside room or outside if it's nice to continue our discussion. And if we don't complete it, we will talk about having another one, but we'll see. And then also Wednesday, all you Enneagrammers, we're back and we'll be meeting Wednesday at four o'clock in the fireside room in person to start the new book that we got like six months ago. And one more thing is uh, in talking with Pastor Amy the other day about having a barbecue on my deck, we thought that we could have a ladies lunch on September 8th, that's a Thursday, at noon, a potluck at my house like we used to do before the pandemic. So if you feel comfortable, it's outside. Um, I'd love to have you come and join me at my house 
September 8th at noon and bring a potluck. And if you could RSVP, that would be great um, because then I can kind of figure out, you know, put enough chairs out. But okay, thank you. That's the projector that's been there since it was donated a long time ago. You probably didn't notice it because we were, Bob and I were dealing with it, so. <laughs> yeah, so we don't look around the room all the time. <laughs> I just wanted to give everybody a fair warning that we are going to do the rummage sale this year october 2nd sunday we are going to bring up the massive amount of stuff from the garage up into the fellowship hall and there's still stuff in the closet so we'll need all hands on deck anybody that can lift invite your neighbors and friends <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in that garage and this is going to be our last rummage sale so what we don't sell we will um, donate so just keep that in mind. The sale is that whole week. So we'll need people to volunteer the whole week to help set up Lisa and um, her husband will be here on the Sunday and Bill will have his truck, which we kind of can load and bring around like we often do. Yes. No, the second is the day we start bringing the rummage up. The sale is that Friday, um, Saturday. Friday, Saturday. Yeah, yeah, but the, all the bringing of the rummages on the second. Any others? Anybody on Zoom? Uh, oh, okay. Well, again, if anyone has anything they need to add to the calendar, I'll I'll send up the tow line this week. Oh, and the other, I guess I should say, just in terms of my office hours, um, Lucas starts high school this week, and Patty Murray, because it's a it's a fairly new high school, is coming to do a tour. So now I'm the PTSA vice president. How did I end up doing that? But uh, so I have to help with that on the 31st. So my hours, my office hours on the 31st are going to be from noon to five instead of. So I'll also be here. But just, I'm doing the afternoon. But so it just gets a little dicey with everybody starting school. I know Amy has a couple things she's got to do with her kid too. So just call ahead if you're wondering. If we're all right, anything else? All right, so please join in our offertory response. Here are our hearts. <laughs> special mic. Mark and I are going to do the blessing from our various uh, lectern and pulpit. Okay, so go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Show love to everyone. Love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. And now our last song is I Am the Light of the World. Thank mm -hmm. you. 